there's a lot of great organizations out there working in advocacy, figuring out different policies, ways we can better organize our, our government and systems to decrease gun violence. But it felt like there was a vacuum of what to do with all the trauma that gun violence causes. Welcome to Conversations on Compassion. I'm Leslie Langbert. Today, my guest is Mike Martin, the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization Raw Tools. Raw Tools has a really inspiring mission. Raw Tools transforms guns into garden tools. And we all are very painfully aware every day in the United States of at least one mass shooting that's happening. So this conversation actually is one that is life affirming and I think hopeful and inspiring, but I also want to encourage you to take care while listening. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's, um, I'm so, so glad that I recently learned about you and your work with Raw Tools. Um, and I think that our listeners today as well are going to be uh, really intrigued. Mike, give me a little bit of background about you and, you know, kind of what led you to feel called to um, to develop Raw Tools. Yeah, so I'm a former uh, youth and young adult pastor, um, and part of my faith was the sorts to plowshares uh, scripture, and that's really what uh, Raw Tools grows out of, um, the idea of taking something that uh, is used to cause harm and turning it into something that is used to heal and feed um, and, and really cultivate life um, and to do that in a modern context. So um, as I was starting the organization uh, after I was a pastor, I also got connected to restorative justice practices um, and heard the story of a mother in Denver, I'm in Colorado Springs, who lost her three-year-old son in a drive-by shooting. So it was They didn't intentionally try to kill him, but it was a product of the shooting. And um, she was the first person in Colorado to go through uh, what is now called high impact dialogue, where uh, you use a a restorative justice process with someone who um, created significant harm to someone else like gun violence. Um, And so she eventually, 17 years later, sat down and talked with the person determined who was a shooter, the person who was the driver. There were three teens, all under 16 or under. So there was a a huge, um, I don't know, motivation to try and facilitate space and work towards a world that looks like her name, Charlotta Evans, and her story, and less like the mass shootings that we're starting to see the Um, increase in gun violence that we're seeing at all different kinds of intersections, whether it's suicide or domestic violence or street violence, uh, police violence, all those things. um, They all, they don't have like a, um, a magic button to, to fix them. And there's a lot of great organizations out there working in advocacy, uh, figuring out different policies, ways we can better uh, organize our, our government and systems to, uh, decrease gun violence, but it felt like there was a vacuum of what to do with all the trauma that gun violence causes. And so as we started turning guns into garden tools, we invited people who were impacted by gun violence into that process. And that's when everything changed for me um, because we kept being told that it was the first time they've dealt with their anger from their grief in a healthy way, um, as opposed to hurting themselves, hurting others, you know, like throwing something against the wall, that that kind of needing to physiologically release energy from your trauma, when you can channel that into a hammer onto a gun barrel that represents something that caused you so much harm while simultaneously creating something that gives life um, 
that that really has where we derive a lot of our work. We are informed a lot by survivors and victims of gun violence in in the work that we do. Yeah, there's clearly such a such a deep trust that that you've earned um, in the community and and your background as a youth pastor and really being uh, being motivated or, or called, you know, through um, through your own spiritual background is is a really uh, powerful part of of your story. Um, you trained to become a blacksmith? Yeah, I didn't know how to blacksmith before. That was one of the kind of uh, paralysis by analysis spaces we got stuck in. We knew we wanted to do it, but we didn't know how. Um, and my dad and I learned how to do it together through a friend or a business acquaintance of his uh, that worked on some heavy equipment at his business uh, who happened to grow up as a blacksmith. And so we went to his shop we said, hey, we have this gun barrel. We want to make a garden tool out of it. And we did it in a few hours. And all of a sudden, it became so accessible, a lot less complicated than I was ever imagining. Um, and which is really, uh, everything kind of hinges on that, that it's so accessible. So when we do events like a buyback, we have eight to 10 saws set up and volunteers from the community are helping us cut up those guns. Or we have volunteers that regularly show up at our shop to help us make tools. Um, some of them affected by gun violence and some not, some just wanting to do something with their hands to, to create a better world because they're sick of writing letters to elected representatives that aren't listening to them, depending on where they live, or, um, you know, just having that other, other thing to do with your hands um, to affect positive change is really valuable to, uh, to a lot of our volunteers and the people we interact with. I really like to think of this as, as it's ceremony, right? That is happening yeah. kind of in community to really Absolutely. say like, this is, you know, the world that we want to live in looks different and we're not only reimagining it, but right now we're, we're actively creating it. Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, that idea of ceremony and ritual really kind of awakens the community to realize the trauma that gun violence is causing on their neighbors. And that's a positive thing from the events that we have where we do that gun to garden tool demonstration, hear from people who've been impacted by gun violence, uh, and then invite them and those present to take a turn with the hammer. And um, it seems to provide a wake up, wake up call, whether they want to get involved with our organization or other organizations in their community. We, we hope to spark that kind of innermost motivation that says some, this it can't go on like this. As, as you know, um, I had my siblings and I inherited a couple of, of firearms. It was like, okay, well, what do we do with these? And of course, one of the options was, well, we can call the local police department and dispose of them that way. But it just, something just kind of didn't really, that didn't entirely feel like the right thing. And so when I heard Bronte Velez talking about uh, led to life. I was like, this, this is it. This is the transformation of the energy that that we're looking for. So I, I'm mentioning this now, and we'll come back to this in the conversation because I'm I'm hopeful that there are people listening to this that are like, oh wow, yeah, actually in a closet or somewhere, you know, or or even you know, if there's a situation where. Uh, there's a firearm in someone's possession that that uh, they've inherited through a, a, a trauma. That there's there's a pathway of healing with that. But I want to talk about some of the ways in which raw tools and the community are coming together. I just saw on Instagram uh, recently that that you all did a a demonstration with a bunch of of kids in the community that that just seemed really powerful. Would you like to share a little bit about that? Yeah, we often like to involve um, people of all ages in the process of turning a, a gun into a garden tool. Um, but this one in particular uh, in Colorado Springs, one of the suburbs is Manitou Springs, and they have a, a space there called Flying Pig Farm. And every year they do summer camps for kids, and we usually team up with them on one of those days. Um, and so we had, uh, I believe it was like third or fourth grade through middle school age kids. Um, and 
throughout the morning, um, we'd rotate groups through and each kid would get a chance to pick up the hammer and, and make something out of it. But also we'd have the conversations about gun violence, about conflict resolution skills. And in this particular area, um, they're actually, uh, their city as a whole is exploring trauma-informed communities. So they're exploring stuff in this community that isn't common in a lot of other spaces, which also means that a lot of their elementary schools and middle and well, all their K through 12 public schools already have restorative practices um, as a model within their school. So dialogue circles, um, you know, every, every day starts with, you know, like a teacher saying, let's circle up or let's do circle time, something around that where they'll process what's going to happen that day. Um, maybe issues they had the last evening with homework or, or a friend or whatever that is. And it was, it was great, you know, talking to, to them about that, contrasting that to kind of this illusion of how guns solve problems for us, whether they're turned on ourselves or others. And uh, one of the kids talking about restorative practices uh, said something, you know, like you should teach this to adults as if there's this change that's happening with younger generations. And I think it might be because they've kind of grown up in this active shooter drill space that I was I was a junior sophomore junior in high school when Columbine happened so a lot of those stuff happened all those drills I never really it was it's the I'm almost 40 so it'd be you know the generation younger than me and they've really kind of this has just been a normalcy a part of their life that they don't want to accept anymore and I think that uh, not just developing these conflict resolution skills but also um, recognizing that they don't need to own guns to solve their problems they don't need to use violence if they're not going to use a gun to solve problems that they're actively practicing these um, dialogue skills not just to have healthy conversations but that when conflict happens they already have a model to to work that out with and i think that connects to to you know inheriting firearms that we are constantly um, have an opportunity to change cycles within our family, within our community. And one of those, I believe, is the, the need uh, or want to have for, of gun ownership. You know, the next, the next 40 years, uh, people are going to be donating or inheriting hundreds of millions of firearms, and they have to choose what they do with that. And sometimes that comes after a tragedy like suicide, because often those firearms are returned to the family as their property. And so a lot of the donations we accept um, are in that instance. And so there's often pastoral or mental health care available if we, we make sure to have connection to those resources when we know that that's the context of the donation we're about to receive so yeah it's it's such a fun time to be able to be in that like community garden space like flying pig farm working with kids it, that gives me so much hope to know that those kids have a, a totally different viewpoint on life than the people 20 30 years older than them mm -hmm. yeah i'm so appreciating the way that we're talking about too that raw tools is about so much more than than just which is so powerful in and of itself you know that that firearms are being melted down and repurposed into garden tools but really talking about such a a holistic model of and we're also you know talking about conflict resolution skills and we're talking about how do we cultivate um, a deeper sense of interconnectedness and interbeing and and reverence for the natural world and, and the earth mm -hmm. and things that grow right. instead of, you know, it's really shifting, it's shifting perspective from destruction to creativity. Does Raw Tools actually uh, have a curriculum or offerings, a program that that folks can access or, you know, if someone's a teacher or if they are in a youth program and, and they're really interested in wanting to work with uh, either students or young people that are in their care, um, are there resources that they can access from, from Raw Tools in their community and how might they go about doing that? Yeah, so that we've got uh, a few resources. One is the book I co-wrote. They're they are all faith-based. Um, part of that is because Christians are one of the largest gun owning blocks in the country. So if we can kind of like how Gandhi said, I liked I like Christ, but I'm not so sure about the Christians or about his followers. Yeah. Um, that if we could hold ourselves more accountable to this crisis. Um, so there's 
we have a resource called Loaded Conversations that just helps communities of faith talk about gun violence. And then there's another one called Fear Not that helps um, institutional spaces develop how to respond to active violence. So you can think active shooter, but really that's not as common as other forms of violence that might show up in institutional spaces. How do we respond to those without responding in kind? And so it's it's really trying to find a way to be a, a hospitable space um, as opposed to kind of the narrative of hardening our schools um, where the more you harden them, the less of kind of like a learning atmosphere it becomes. Um, and so not that you're going to be totally naive about um, the possibilities of active violence happening in your space, but that you're going to make an uh, intentional effort to think outside the box, to respond in ways that um, will, will cultivate imagination, will um, still be able to respond in a healthy and active way to a form of active violence. And that doesn't just go to kind of like the what if that imagines the worst possible scenario for you, but also after. Uh, so that kind of trauma-informed space, if something happens in our space, how are we going to heal from it? That's part of this too. Not just how are we going to stop it, but how are we going to heal from it? And are we active enough in our communities to provide the resources that people need so they don't feel like they have to grab a gun? Um, do we have equal access to healthcare, food, equitable wages, those kinds of things? All of those, especially when you talk about suicide, people talk about kind of different pillars that one, two or three of those fall, then that puts someone more at risk for attempting. And um, if we can if we can make sure that our, our communities have those pillars, but also that they're equally accessible by the people in the community, then rates of violence go down. Um, and then uh, uh, that the other one we would have is the book Beating Guns uh, that I co-wrote. And that really is just trying to spark an, a new imaginative response to this crisis. So beyond that, there's a lot of other things like uh, the Be Smart campaign that Moms Domain Action puts out just talks about, you know, when your kids have playdates at another person's house, you ask the parents, do you have firearms? And if you do, are they locked up? If they're not, then the kids can come play at our house kind of space. So just open, blunt conversations as, as simple as that. You can you can find those uh, Google search or raw tools. Um, or free feel to reach feel free to reach out to us. Mike, let's um let's take a moment just to kind of shift into um how you're feeling in this time and with all of the really positive impact that you're making and there's also so much that's alive in the field in terms of growing inequity, increasing what feels like increasing violence. So, so many challenges. What helps to sustain you? How do you kind of replenish, recharge, and how do you find self-care? I uh, was. Well, so there's, there, especially after um, Buffalo and Uvalde and Tulsa, there was kind of this moment that you always question, like, is this even making a difference kind of thing? And I think um, I kind of, I have to continually remind myself that this is a, a slow growth, that destruction is always easier and quicker than creation. And so really for me, it's getting out into creation. One of the things I did in, in COVID was got a kayak and that has helped me last week i went we our family went camping so a lot of family time uh out and in, in the outdoors is something that really helps kind of replenish me i think i'm a extroverted introvert so i like to i do like to be around people but i need a lot of recovery time when i do that so um that's i think just getting outdoors um i'm lucky that i'm in colorado at the base of pike's peak in this the foothills out here so it's a space that helps me heal a little bit or helps me um, build back uh, the energy to, to start the next day. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. The connection in, in the natural world is uh, definitely a really powerful one for me too. I appreciate that so much living here in Tucson that there's always an opportunity to like 
get out and go and go into to the mountains to uh, reconnect mm-hmm. and kind of put it all back into perspective. And so I, yeah, I'm sensing into the, the, the courage that it takes for you to have created this organization and for you to be doing this work. Do you want to speak to that a little bit in terms of, you know, have you have you been met with challenges either from individuals? Do you have you received pushback from, you know, either on a on a larger um, like state sanction level at all? Like has there what kind of pushback do you see to the work that you're doing? So I, I was certainly I think paranoid is the right word when we started to wonder because when you file even just the papers to start an organization you have to put someone's home address so we thought through you know what did we want to put our home address um one of our founding board members has been an active peacemaking protester in the Colorado Springs area for years and they were quick to offer theirs and so that helped myself out a little bit um but we found that most of the criticism lies with the people who are donating the firearms. So it's it seems that <clears throat> Raw Tools, even from the very beginning, was kind of this unchangeable organization, right? We have this mission and vision, and that's what we do. So it didn't it it for whatever reason, it feels like people who were would want to troll or and, and I mean like in person, not necessarily online comments. Those are just gonna be there all the time. But that the people for instance, the person who donated the first firearm to us, he wanted to make it public. It was two and a half months after Sandy Hook. He had an AK-47 that he didn't want his grandkids to get a hold of. Um, and so we cut it up and he invited the press there. And he was the one who received all the vitriol from the community, not us. It's like we weren't even a mention. I also think part of that is people don't want to legitimize what we do, the people who don't like what we do. So they try and focus on the the person um we have had zero protests at any events that we've done and that includes like a a 37 city book tour where a gun was getting more multiple guns were getting cut up at every single site um so it was and it was well publicized so it's not like people don't know where we're at there are some concerns with churches when we started doing buybacks with them um without law enforcement and those events actually looked more like like a church car wash than it did like a gun buyback that it was a really uplifting, you know, they had welcoming signs, they rang bells when an assault style weapon was turned in, you know, there was just this totally different atmosphere. And that church did receive some calls and some nasty emails, um, but nothing came of it. Um, And so I think that that is out there. We've done an event in Louisville one year, Um, That happens the same time every year in the same city, but that year, the theme was Pathways to Nonviolence, and it also happened to be the same time and week that the NRA convention was in town, and so usually the Festival of Faiths is what it was called, would kind of like buy the advertising all through downtown. So all the street signs and stuff like that would be for them. But because of the power of the NRA, they had to give up half of it. So on one side of the street, you had these pathways to nonviolence uh, signs and advertising. On the other side of the street, you had all the NRA signs and advertising. So it really was, it felt like everywhere you went, there was like this fork in the road, like which direction am I going to choose? And so we were downtown, but their convention was out by the airport but we were down by like Louisville Bat Museum and a lot of other tourist spaces. Some of the concerts that they were having were downtown. And so people would walk by where we were set up and wonder what we're doing. That anvil is kind of this, I don't know, it just beckons people to come watch and they would come over and ask what we're doing. And um, so we'd we'd have mostly civil conversations there. Most the people that would stay and talk, most people would just shake their heads and walk off and And really, I think, you know, there's this, if people are in a space that just is disagreeable to you, they're not going to talk to you, right? And unless you have like a a relationship with them. And so I found most of my active conversations with people who disagree with me are people who I already have a relationship with, um, that it's hard to kind of have those conversations unless you have that relationship and unless you're going to commit to keep having those conversations. So, yeah, I think there's definitely that pushback out there, but it's nothing like what I what I was imagining in my head. Yeah, no, that's that's really encouraging to hear. It points to, I think, for me, like that that there's there definitely are are more more people that are that are uh, in support of, and I think probably also looking 
for uh, for options to be able to dispose of of firearms in a um, transformative way and a safe way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about about the raw the raw tools network and. Uh, I, and I want to say too, you know, coming back to you, the the really thoughtful way that that you have established every step of this to be uh, really deeply trauma informed and and also safe. So on the website, there's a form that um, that you can complete that's that's thorough. But it was just it was so thoughtful in terms of um, you know do you, do you need additional. Uh, resources and the way of like care and support around this and you know was there a traumatic event um, related to this particular uh, donation but it felt really important to us uh, to really kind of help to um, transform some of the energy in that in that part of the line and so when I reached out, um, when I reached out to you, and I was like, "Well, I'm in Tucson. But the weapons are in Florida, and so you know how how do I do this?" And it was just, it was so wonderful the way that you put me in touch with someone who uh, lives in in the area in Florida, who was an absolute delight. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name him fully, but um, shout out to Chris if he's listening to this. I still like have so much appreciation for you and your kindness and welcoming me into your home while you uh, took care of uh, of cutting up the the weapons that I brought to you. And yeah, it was just it was the way that you facilitated it. You know, like I'm like okay, I have no idea who this person is in the network. Like, <laughs> where am I going? And Everything about it was just wonderful that you're like, yeah, just, you know, keep me in the in the email conversation when you get it scheduled and all of that. So I'm sharing all this. I'm rambling on because I want people to be aware that if you're not living in Colorado Springs, if you're not living in uh, a community where there is a ceremony, where there is a demonstration, that that there is a really uh, beautiful network. And so do you want to share about that, about the the Raw Tools Network? Yeah, so all of this just kind of gradually grew where we'd start, we'd just go somewhere and turn a gun into a garden tool and whoever is hosting us, which is also, I think, a, a reason why we haven't had protests is because usually we partner with churches that are a positive influence in their community. So someone can't protest us without also going against something in the community that is a positive uh, affect. So we built this, you know, we do an event and someone be like, hey, can we keep doing this here? It's like, yeah, maybe we'll leave this saw with you. Or if you have access to funds, you can get a saw and the equipment you need to cut this up. And so it slowly built from there. Uh, we did the book tour in 2019 before the, about a year before the pandemic, really that out of those 37 cities, probably two thirds of them are now people who help us in our network. So we have almost a uh, hundred volunteers on our network. Now uh, the, the map on our website is woefully out of date. It's just been so many new people. It's uh, I haven't had time to add the little, marks on the map there, but most most volunteers in that or the people who are donating a firearm will drive, you know, they'll spend a day if they need to get, just because they know that their gun will be destroyed at the end of it. And it's not just something they're dropping off with law enforcement or reselling and, and putting back in the market. And that's really valuable to have and to know that it's going to get cut up in front of you. So oftentimes it's been partners with um, faith spaces or people who are connected to community organizations who, who do this, who may not be comfortable advertising themselves, but they want to be part of a uh, a national network. So if someone in their area wants to donate a firearm, I connect them to the closest volunteer in, in that area. And so we have the less, the least amount of volunteers a lot uh, through the South, the Bible Belt area. But if there isn't someone on the map, you can still contact us because we have connections in a lot of places um, that we try and, and nourish and ask and just kind of put the ball in their court and say, hey, do you want to start cutting up guns for us? Is this something your church or your organization wants to do with us uh, on a regular basis. And so, and then that kind of trauma informed piece is we just want to make sure that we're present with folks as this happens and that if they need access to other things that I don't, I don't necessarily have like a resource for each 100 volunteers to connect with, but they probably do. And it really is a good exercise that if this happens and that volunteer isn't aware, 
then they do the homework and they start to be aware. And it really is a great motivator to say, hey, where are these resources? Or why isn't there any on this side of town? Why is it only on, on the other side of the tracks kind of space? And so it's really not just become this network of people who want to help cut up firearms, but a network of people who want to look into the resources to make their communities better because of the connection that it has to gun violence. So I want to bring us back to around to uh, the life affirming and creative energy, uh, the transformation um, into the tools. I'd love to hear more about um, some of the farms and community gardens where your tools have um, are now, you know, in, in use. Yeah. So it's I actually don't have many connections to where they all are at because they're usually in partnership with places that hosted us. So uh, like one in Toledo, we had it at, a, it was an, an interfaith space that had a community garden um, that grew fresh food for an elementary school next door. And so it's, it looks a lot like that. Um, we also, I mean, my church has a community garden and we had, we've had tools there, but it is, is certainly a kind of a goal of ours to start outfitting community gardens or co-ops with our tools so that you can start measuring this is how many pounds of food these tools grew this year instead of this is how many lives that these guns took that that's the outcomes that we want to start to move towards and encourage and those are already happening we're just not measuring them but we are taking hold of the relationships that those build Um, like flying pig farm got the tool we made it stayed there wherever we do events the tools stay there they're made from guns in their communities and it really is important to connect that Um, we're doing eight buybacks this year with denver and aurora biggest metro areas in colorado and from we've already gotten 600 firearms and there's uh, three more buybacks left we'll probably get right around a thousand and all those pieces and parts are kind of our payment because we'll make tools and sell them, but we're also going to be donating a lot of those tools to green spaces in the area and hopefully employing youth and young adults to help make them. So there's all different intersections of this or not necessarily intersections, but places you can intersect the process with community involvement. And um, one of the great things is there's more and more studies coming out that when you green space in a neglected area of a uh, city or town, doesn't matter what it is, violence decreases by at least 30%. So there is this uh, tangible effect that removing firearms, we know that also decreases firearm violence, but then repurposing them into something that will green a space will also decrease violence of all kinds in that community. So being able to uh, care for a space, and that's largely where that decrease comes from, you have a neglected neighborhood that doesn't feel like anyone cares for them and all of a sudden there's resources dedicated to that neighborhood to create a positive space then when you feel cared for you act differently and i think that's the biggest connection in these community gardens and these community spaces is to say we don't want guns because we care about each other and we don't want to be put in situations where we're going to be be uh, pointing them at each other we'd rather be pointing these tools into the ground and cultivating food and relationships that make our communities better. So there's a lot of places that have our tools, uh, community gardens that use them and they get to tell that story. And it's just one of those great moments that you get to have with a neighbor who's at the community garden in a bed next to you. And you have a tool that looks nothing like anybody else's tool. So they're gonna ask you, what, what is that? Where did you get that? It looks like a good tool. And, and then it goes from there. That's awesome. Just absolutely amazing, inspiring. So Mike, as we get ready to, to let you go here, what else, um, what would you like to share? Anything else? Uh, well, we do have one of our board members is in Tucson and they um, just started with another um, therapist friend of theirs. Uh, something called the Raiz Collective. I don't know if my guess is it's not out too much in the public yet, but we're their fiscal sponsor and they provide uh, mental health care to at-risk populations, especially LGBTQ folks and people who identify as a marginalized community. Um, They got some grant funding from a local food bank there. Um, So if people want to connect there, we also have an active person who helps disable guns there in Tucson. I think I might have mentioned that when you started reaching out, but since it was uh, kind of managing a state in another state, 
that it didn't work out. But um, and they do kind of stuff around affordable housing and affordable upkeep for people who can't afford to upkeep their houses. So there's definitely places in Tucson that we can connect you with if people want to connect with Raw Tools directly. And just because we have someone in Tucson already cutting up guns doesn't mean other people in Tucson can't do it too. Because the quicker we can do it, the better. And our volunteers aren't always available right away, especially in the summers when everyone's traveling. So if people want to get more involved, feel free to reach out uh, on our website at rawtools.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and social media uh, and uh, Instagram. And that's where we often put our uh, upcoming events, things that are happening, like what we did at Flying Pig Farm. And uh, and then you can sign up for our newsletter. That's where we announce when our tools are for sale. There's going to be another batch coming in the next week or two. We usually, we try and do about two dozen a month. That doesn't always happen that way. Once we announce it on our newsletter, they're usually sold out within a few hours. So that's the best way to know when it looks like we're always out of stock, but that's not true. We do update it. They just sell really, really quickly once we put it on there. And there's other kind of, you know, like, uh, I don't know, traditional swag you can get there too. But yeah, we'd, we'd love very grassroots oriented and, and community minded and would love to connect with people if they want to get involved. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me, Leslie. Thanks for listening. Conversations on Compassion is produced by me, Leslie Langbert, and the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Center for Compassion Studies. Our engineer is Gary Darnell with the University Center for Assessment, Teaching, and Technology. To learn more about the Center for Compassion Studies, visit us online at compassioncenter.arizona.edu or follow us on Instagram at UA underscore Compassion Center.